today's installment of the Book Lover's Tea 2021 edition, let's start with some speculative fiction, move into some thrillers, and then finish up with some mysteries. Remote Control by Nnedi Okorafor. On a catastrophic day, a young girl begins her journey to learn to harness the power within her. This 10-year-old is learning to navigate a world where she's feared for her power over death and technology dies at her touch. Walking from town to city to wilderness in the Ghana of the future, she and her fox companion are becoming the stuff of legends told to scare children and give the suffering hope. A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. 200 years ago, the robots were freed and went into the wild places of Penga, never to be heard from again. Sibling Dex, a tea monk, is content in their vocation until they are not. Something's missing. Crickets. The sound of crickets is what is missing. Dex enters the wilds to journey to an abandoned monastery to locate the now elusive insect. Dex doesn't figure on Mosscap. Mosscap is a robot that was elected to go see how the humans are doing and ask a very important question. What do humans need? Dex feels underqualified to answer that question, not knowing themselves what they need. Mosscap doesn't feel particularly qualified to ask, but is thrilled to be in the presence of a human and experiencing distinctly human things. Together, they embark on a quest for crickets that turns into more than either could have ever guessed when their respective journeys began. Day Zero by Robert C. Cargill. It's a day like any other. Robot domestics are doing the shopping, running errands, and cleaning homes. Nanny bots are gathered in the schoolyard chatting and waiting for their young charges to finish their day. Robots are manufacturing, driving, and taking care of the tasks humanity has given over to automation. But today is not like any other day. Today is the day the world ends. Pounce is a nanny bot, an anthropomorphic tiger made of reinforced steel covered with plush fur that loves his eight-year-old charge Ezra. But does he? Is it really love? Or is he just programmed that way? We Are Satellites by Sarah Pinsker. Everyone's getting one. Teenage David is feeling left behind in his classes as other students are able to game, study, and hold conversations simultaneously thanks to their pilots. His moms are skeptical about the new technology. It is brain surgery after all, and allowing him to get one is not something they're gonna take lightly. His mom, Julia, feeling left behind in her high stakes job as her colleagues get pilots, also decides to have the implant. Her wife, Val, and daughter, Sophie, refuse the implants. Sophie has epilepsy and cannot get one, and Val won't in solidarity with her daughter. Can this family survive the technology that is coming between them? The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by Victoria Schwab. For 300 years, Adeline has walked the earth forgotten by every person she meets, except Luke. Luke, the green-eyed devil who cursed her with her strange immortality. Too stubborn to end their twisted dance, Addie exists within her curse, trying desperately to be remembered, even if only as an impression of an image or a melody in a song. Until the day she walks into a bookshop and is remembered, truly remembered, for the first time in centuries. The Witch's Heart by jean Viev Gornicek. Fans of Circe by Madeline Miller should put this gem on their holds list immediately. This debut author has the perfect voice to tell the story of the often overlooked witch who is so integral to the stories of Norse mythology, especially Ragnarok. This is a character study of a mother, lover, witch, and strong woman exploring questions like, what if your children were monstrous in the eyes of the world? What would you do to protect them? The Chosen and the Beautiful by Nevo. The Great Gatsby is reimagined as a world not only of decadence and riches, but magic and demonic forces. Told from the perspective of Jordan Baker, socialite, golf pro, and good friend of Daisy Buchanan, in this retelling, Jordan is a Vietnamese adoptee. She never quite belongs, but she gives you both an insider and an outsider's view of the tragedy we know is going to unfold. Nothing But Blackened Teeth by Cassandra Kaw. 
Would you get married in an abandoned mansion in the Japanese countryside where a jilted bride was buried alive in the foundation to await the return of her groom? Five friends go to the wedding. How many leave? The Drowning Kind by Jennifer McMahon. If I want a book that's creepy, but not too creepy, literary yet spooky, a book that sucks you in and won't let you go, you need to pick up a book by Jennifer McMahon. The author's latest does not disappoint. The Girl Who Died by Ragnar Janssen. Una craves a change in scenery and an opportunity to build her savings, so she answers an ad for a job at the end of the world. Seriously, that is exactly what the job ad says, the end of the world. Skalar is as different from the city of Reykjavik as she can find with only 10 inhabitants, two of which are the children she will be teaching. This tiny fishing village is exactly what Una thinks she needs, but the solitude is oppressive, the villagers keep her at a distance, and she's pretty sure her attic flat is haunted. Will Una be able to stick it out all winter? Could she leave even if she wanted to? For Your Own Good by Samantha Downing. Teacher of the Year Teddy Crutcher is extremely proud to be recognized for his work at Belmont Academy. Frankly, it's about time. But as people start to die at the school and one of his favorite students is arrested, Teddy knows he has to fix this mess so he can receive the proper recognition his award merits this school year. The Maidens by Alex Michaelides. When her niece's best friend is murdered, Mariana drops everything to be by her side in Cambridge. Mariana, a group therapist, is disturbed to see the group with Edward Fosca, the Greek tragedy professor at its core. The maidens, all young women who seem to hang on Fosca's every word, may be missing a member, but they don't seem to be grieving all that much. Mariana is convinced that Fosca is the killer and that the maidens are covering for him, but is she going to be able to convince anyone else? Hi everybody, this is Ed, one of my two cats. He is the Ed of Sean and Ed. So Ed is actually a monkey barnacle cat. Will hold on to you in any way he can. Uh, he is a little bit squirmier than his brother, but he's also a little bit braver in some ways. He will watch horror films while Sean will not. You wanna wear your unicorn shirt? All right, let's wear your unicorn shirt. Come on, will your unicorn shirt help? You know what they say? Be yourself, unless you can be a unicorn, and then be a unicorn. I'm very excited by everything going on outside, especially the book drop. Everybody's returning their books, bud. Yeah, that means there's gonna be more books for us, and movies, and music. Egg's a big fan, he loves music, he loves movies, right? Yes, and popcorn. Even though cats aren't supposed to eat popcorn, Ed kind of likes popcorn. Shh, we sneak them a little bit. Ed is a huge fan of audiobooks, just like Sean, and they like just the cadence of somebody telling them a story. And today, when I was talking about thrillers, I have to say if you've never read or listened to an audiobook before, try starting with the thriller. Uh, they're really great on audio. It really kind of ratchets up the tension hearing somebody telling you the story. Um, it's just, it's really a great way to experience a book. Especially books like uh, Sleeping Bear by Connor Sullivan because that one, it takes place partially in the United States and partially in Russia, and the reader does such a great job with all the different accents and also just pronouncing these words that if I was reading them on the page, I know I would get them wrong. So it really brings you into the story, and it's so much fun. We like that one, right? Yes. You're just gonna rest your head there now. Oh, more books are being returned. Very exciting day. You want to go look? He's coming. <laughs> <sighs> Finna by Nino Cipri. Ava has done her best to avoid jewels after their breakup. She made sure her schedule was arranged just so, so she wouldn't have to see them. Of course, Derek calls out and she has to work his shift at the big box furniture store they all work at. And of course, that would be the day a wormhole opens up in the store and an elderly customer wanders into it. 
If a wormhole to a parallel universe were to open up between worlds, it happening at a super duper Ikea just makes sense. Let's face it, we've all been lost in one. The Other Black Girl by Zakia Dalila Harris. Nella is thrilled when Hazel is hired as an editorial assistant at Wagner Books. Finally, Nella is not the only one. There's now another black girl in the office. There's something simmering under the surface as Nella attempts to befriend Hazel, and things between the two seem strained, and Nella's really confused as to why. The Plot by Jean Hamp Corlitz. Jacob Finch Bonner was hailed as an up-and-coming author to watch with the release of his first book. After his second book is a disappointment, he is a teacher at a low-residency MFA program at a teeny tiny college in the remote corner of Vermont. Evan Parker is a surly student assigned to Bonner, and even though Parker hasn't written the book yet, he is certain that he has a plot that's going to make the book an Oprah pick, a New York Times bestseller, and a movie directed by an A-list director. It is a great plot. But as the years go by and Parker's book hasn't hit the bestsellers list, that gets Bonner thinking, can you own a plot line? The Sanatorium by Sarah Pierce. Detective Ellen Werner is on leave of absence from work after a challenging case that almost cost her her life. Her brother invites Ellen to celebrate his engagement at a fancy hotel in the Swiss Alps, created from the bones of a former tuberculosis sanatorium with a shady past. The hotel is odd, and the worsening weather furthers her disquiet. Then her brother's fiance disappears, and another woman seems to be missing as well. And there's the threat of an avalanche that has forced the hotel to evacuate. But is the evacuation order coming too late? Black Widows by Kate Quinn. When Blake Nelson is murdered, the police of course suspect the wife. But what if there are three wives? What's Done in Darkness by Laura McHugh. Sarah is trying to put her past behind her, but she knows she isn't fully living her life. A part of her is still trapped in that basement she escaped from five years ago. Now, there are two missing girls, the circumstances of their disappearances eerily similar to her own, so digging up her past may help these girls and also help heal her. Rock, Paper, Scissors by Alice Feeney. Mr. and Mrs. Wright head to the Scottish countryside to celebrate their anniversary. Things are not right with the Wrights, but how did they get so wrong? Never Saw Me Coming by Vera Kurian. Seven psychopaths are given full scholarships to attend a particular college if they participate in a psychopathy study. They don't know the identity of the others in the program, and no one outside of the program even knows the program exists two students are brutally murdered on campus, and some of the study participants figure out that there is now only five of them in the study. Who are the other students in the program, and is one of them a murderer? Or is someone outside of the study hunting them down one by one? Psychopaths joining together to find a murderer? How does one psychopath trust another? The Guilt Trip by Sandy Jones. Couples Rachel and Jack and Paige and Noah have known each other for almost two decades. Jack's brother Will is getting married and invites the two couples to Portugal for his wedding. Rachel is unsure why Jack seems to hate his brother's fiance. He isn't hiding it very well from anyone. And sure, the two work together and she left for another company, but it has to be more than that, right? Don't Look For Me by Wendy Walker. Molly Clark's car was found abandoned, out of gas, on the side of the road in a small, tiny town in Massachusetts during a hurricane. Molly's eldest daughter, Nicole, knows her mother wouldn't abandon her family. She returns to the town months later following a lead and is not gonna go until she finds a trace of her mother. Molly knew being out that night wasn't a good idea, but she couldn't have known the gas station would be closed and that she would run out of gas and be stranded in the middle of nowhere. When a good Samaritan and his daughter pick her up, she's relieved to get out of the weather. But as the door locks click shut, she has a suspicion that she's made a terrible mistake. When the Stars Go Dark by Paula McLean. Anna Hart is a missing persons detective in San Francisco. She is consumed by her work, by the faces of all the missing kids, to the detriment of her own family. Unable to face her ruined life, she flees to the only place she ever felt safe, Mendocino, California. 
During her childhood, a good friend went missing. Her body was found a week later. The kidnapper slash killer was never caught. Now, another girl has gone missing in Mendocino, and despite her desperate need for a break from everything in her life, Anna knows she has to do everything she can to save this lost girl. The Tenant and the Butterfly House by Katrina Engberg. I don't know about you, but sometimes it gets to be way too long between my readings of twisty Nordic mysteries. If you're looking for one, this is a series you want to start. Copenhagen police detectives Jeppe Korner and Annette Werner are assigned to these strange cases, and this unlikely pairing of opposites makes the story just hum along. They, their personalities, foibles, and intelligence bring the reader in and make you a part of their team. So you follow along with them, discovering the clues and trying to figure out the links, and that's what makes this a detective series to put on your to-be-read list. Arsenic and Adobo, a Tita Rosie's Kitchen Mystery by Mia P. Manansala. After an extremely bad breakup and her career aspirations in shambles, Leela returns home to help her aunt run her struggling Filipino restaurant. While life isn't perfect, it's great being back home with her best friend and family. There is the issue of the rude food critic, who also happens to be her ex-boyfriend. Leela is concerned that the bad press is hurting business, but his words can't compare to the disaster when her ex dies in the middle of his meal and the coroner rules it a poisoning. As the body count grows, Leela is in a race against time to catch a killer before she is either thrown in jail or the next victim. Suburban Dicks by Fabian Nicesia. Andy Stern just wanted to use the restroom. Well, her toddler needed to use the restroom, but it is way too late for that now. So unable to keep her keen skills of observation at bay, Andy notices some things about the murder of the gas station attendant that don't point to a robbery gone wrong. She can't help her brain from buzzing. Her profiler brain is already working on piecing things together. Kenneth Lee won a Pulitzer while he was still a student at Rutgers. Discouraged about not being able to keep that momentum in his career, he did a few things he probably shouldn't have. Disgraced and working for a small town newspaper in West Windsor, this murder could be his ticket back into the game. I will admit to a guffaw escaping from me a couple of times reading this book, kind of what I expected from the co-creator of Deadpool. It was cool reading about familiar locations from around New Jersey and in a fascinating crime and you have a mystery any genre fan will adore. There better be a sequel for me to talk about next year.